People are living longer, and there is an aging population. In 2020, there was approximately a billion people in the world that was 60 years or older. And it's projected and estimated that by 2030, one in six people in the world will become an elderly person. Now, Hong Kong is a city with one of the longest life expectancies in the world. And many of us want to live long with good health. Unfortunately, many health conditions can often accompany as we age. Now, I'm an orthopedic surgeon by training, and I see many and many patients that come in with minor injuries or trivial falls suffering from a fracture. Unfortunately, osteoporosis is a highly prevalent disease amongst the elderly populations. Because as we age, these porosities in our bones become larger and larger, making the bone weak and fragile. And we build less bone than we lose. So therefore, in people with osteoporosis, when they fall down or have a trivial minor injury, they can break the bones. And one of my jobs is to fix broken bones. Now, a question for the audience. Who knows someone old? Please raise up your hands. Yes, should be pretty much everyone. But what if I told you? Studies have actually shown that one in three women and one in five men, 50 years of age or older, can suffer from an osteoporotic-related fracture in their remaining lifetime. Some of us are quite young, we may not necessarily relate, but it could also mean that someone we know personally can suffer from these types of fractures. And therefore, it's very important for everyone to be aware of osteoporosis. And it's also very important for clinicians to actually manage the disease effectively because the consequences can be detrimental. Now, when a patient actually has an osteoporotic fracture, it can be extremely debilitating. And there are many different examples of osteoporotic fractures that occurs. And one of the common locations that we have are the hip fractures, shoulder fractures, spine fractures, or even the wrist fractures, all these different places. And these, one of the most serious forms of osteoporotic fractures are in fact hip fractures. It's actually projected by 2050 that there'll be two and a half million hip fractures every year, just in Asia alone. So why are hip fractures so detrimental? Well, in fact, for these patients, approximately up to 30% of them will die in one year's time. Hip fracture patients are at increase of risk of heart attacks, strokes, chest infections, and the list goes on. I'd like to ask everyone again, we may know old people, but do you know whether they have osteoporosis or not? Unfortunately, osteoporosis is in fact a silent disease. Most people do not actually have any symptoms until they actually break their bones. So therefore, when people sustain a hip fracture, it can be very debilitating and very disabling. Imagine unable to walk again. Obviously, hip fractures are in fact the top, one of the top disabling diseases that exists worldwide. And regarding hip fractures itself, we tend to operate on these patients in order, firstly, to decrease their pain, and secondly, to help them mobilize better. For the orthopedics community, we've actually had many different initiatives trying to help these patients, and our team of clinicians have also had professional networks and alliances worldwide to help these patients to make the situation actually better. But for me, with a patient with a hip fracture in such debilitating pain, and after surgery, to be able to stand up again and walk again, that's extremely gratifying for me. 
because motion is life. And the quality of life that these patients get back is extremely important to us. Similarly, for other osteoporotic fractures, sometimes we do operate on them for early mobilizations as well. Now, in this aging population, many different fractures occur, affecting many people worldwide. Now, before my medical training, I in fact obtained a Bachelor of Computing because I was very interested in computers and computer-assisted surgeries. I would often do programming and seeing the cool ways in how to actually apply this. And during my undergraduate studies, I felt that after a completed degree, I still needed clinical knowledge to further translate my research and also findings to help more patients worldwide. And I, after I finished medical school, obviously I felt that I could only help that many people with my own hands. And I wanted to spread more impact, help more patients, and benefit more people. And that's when I decided I wanted to become an academic surgeon, which is to really uptake the role as a clinician scientist and to advance surgical sciences via innovative and translational research. So when I finished my Bachelor of Computing, I went through the five years of medical school, one year of internship, and six years of orthopedic training. And merging and combining these two disciplines together really broadened my horizons. Now I wanted to see how I can use technology to help patients and help people learn. In fact, our department has started this theme called Precision Orthopedics and Innovative Technologies. And to me, to be honest, it's very exciting. I feel like I'm back in the days whereas when I was an undergraduate student doing computer science again. And I believe that it's extremely important to have like-minded individuals as a team and our team consists of clinicians and engineers together, and we all share the same vision and passion to help our patients and to improve and advance healthcare. So back in medical school, I was reading and studying and learning anatomy via textbooks. And obviously, a lot of these things are quite two-dimensional, as you can imagine. Luckily, we did have cadavers, skeleton models to learn from, but a lot of these were to learn of normal anatomy. So what we sometimes use, or we can use, are these 3D printing models. And I'm sure a lot of us in the audience have heard of these things. I've got an example today. And in fact, this is a pelvis 3D printed model, um, just from CT scans. And in fact, there is a fracture which is fixated with surgical implants. And these can be used for learning. In fact, studies have actually shown that the use of 3D models, some are actually more satisfied as compared to the conventional way of learning. Because it's more case specific. You can imagine holding this model, talking about the surgical approaches, surgical anatomy, the details of fracture fixation, etc and it can be very useful. But in order to go a step further, we dwelled into the realm of augmented reality. We wanted to envision a different dimension of learning and see how we can go a step further. And so take a look at this video. This, in essence, I was sitting on a sofa looking at the pelvis model we can, in essence, turn this pelvis model with all these annotations and labels, learning surgical anatomy, 360 degrees. We can look inside the pelvis model, look outside, zoom in, zoom out, move the object around in a casual fashion. And the possibilities are limitless. Imagine the details that we can additionally place onto this. For example, the soft tissues, the blood vessels, the nerves, to me, it's a completely new dimension of learning. And more importantly, 
The possibilities of using this to educate our patients before the operations become possible. And that's important. So I was also one day operating on a complex fracture case. And you can imagine, for complex fracture cases, sometimes the fractures can be shattered of all these different fragments. And so what we sometimes do are these CT scans of the patients, and we project these on 2D monitors in the operation theater itself. So as we are operating, sometimes we go to the 2D screen, take a look, envision and visualize how we would fix the fracture, go back to the patient, and keep on operating. Sometimes that could be quite inconvenient, right? So again, we can use these 3D printing models as well. In fact, a recent meta-analysis have actually shown that the use of 3D printing decreases the surgical time, decreases blood loss, improves the accuracy, and decreases x-ray times in some cases. Furthermore, more importantly, it doesn't increase the risk of complications. In fact, 3D printing is a rapidly developing field in orthopedics. But you may ask me, how does it work? How does it get those good results? Well, the reason is because when we have a 3D model, before the operation, we can actually simulate the surgery a couple of times. We can plan preoperatively before the operation. Intraoperatively, we can take a look at it in a 3D fashion right in front of us to help us with the surgery. And so that's why it's useful, right? But again, we further went into the technology because we wanted to see the possibilities. And we looked into augmented reality. I envision that in the future, one day, if we have these smart lenses on us, that we can look into the surgical anatomy of a patient underneath the skin, the soft tissue, blood vessels, nerves, the bones, everything, very easily. Because in elderly patients, sometimes, they have less reserve as compared to healthy young individuals. So it may be beneficial to do minimally invasive operations sometimes. And to be able to use different types of technology would be excellent. Take a look at this video. And we're currently at the early stages of development. And hopefully one day we will go on to do research for the clinical aspects, in essence. This is a video where you can see the pelvis model at the bottom left corner. We're using navigation to track on our screw that we want to place on. The image in the center is what we see via the augmented reality lenses. And we can turn the model around. So what we're trying to do is we want to insert screws so that we're not hitting on important structures and we're fixing the fracture good. And we can turn the image around, take a look, and whether we're happy with it. And the limits, there's a lot in terms of possibilities. There's no limit to it. And we can, in fact, add more surgical details, as you can imagine, all the soft tissue, nerves, and blood vessels, et cetera. But what I really wanted to get out of today is not of augmented reality or other types of technologies. It's the power of technology. The power of that, it's limitless. There's many possibilities that we can do. And I believe that we should never stop trying because through innovative and positive